Okay, welcome to the next part on variational methods for computer vision. Last time we talked about v uh, v optical flow and correspondence problems, and uh, we'll continue here today. Uh, uh, I wanted to mention a couple of applications of correspondence estimation, flow uh, and uh, motion estimation. So one uh, key aspect uh, of motion estimation is that you can use motion information to identify coherent objects in a scene. For example, we talked about segmentation already and, and you saw that uh, there are many assumptions to uh, which allow to separate the, an object from its background. And the traditional kind of 70s or 80s paradigm was that you have a black object on white background. So if you were to segment me in front of this scene, that would actually work fairly well because I'm fairly dark and the background is fairly bright. But as you know, in, uh, in our real-world environment, that typically isn't the case. And very often the object of interest doesn't really differ much from the background in terms of its typical colors. And in the extreme setting, I, we saw examples uh, in the last uh, chapter of uh, these crocodiles or tigers in their environment, and there the colors really don't differ. And then the question is st still, how can you get uh, the notion of an object? How can you do this figure ground separation? And for that, motion tends to be quite important. And we as humans tend to identify a lot of these camouflaged objects, often only once they move. And so before they move, like you often you, you see, you don't actually see them in their environment, but once they start moving, you can pick out where is the object. And so motion is really vital for humans and for, for image analysis to detect objects, to segment objects. And then you can track them, you can actually follow an object, this is called tracking over a video, where you associate uh, points in one image with points in the next to keep track of where is the object moving. And that can be either all points of the object or just the center of gravity or something like that. Motion is also used in depth estimation from stereo. For example, if you have a moving camera and the world is static, so it's not that the objects are moving, but that the camera itself is moving, then from the, from the perceived motion of things, you can uh, infer their depths, from the, their distance from the camera. Something that you all know if you look out the window uh, from, of a moving car, Things in the background, you know, have very little apparent motion. Things in the foreground uh, are moving faster relative to the observer. <coughs> and then you can do things like driver assistance. You can compute things like a time to impact. You know, if you have an object in front of you and you see it expanding while you move closer to it, you can compute how long does it take until I hit that object. And these numbers are really important for you know deciding should I break, should I not break in an automatic setting. And then uh, you know, sometimes depending on what is the time to impact, you would decide maybe I should rather uh, 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 start an evasion uh, maneuver uh, because braking may be too late. And then motion can be used in very other contexts. For example, for video compression, you can use motion to compress information. For example, typically we have uh, in many scenes a static background and an object moving, and so I can store the whole video essentially by you know figuring out what is the object and what is the motion of its object. And you can, in principle, then resynthesize the whole video from just knowing the objects and their motion. The MPEG standard ideally assumes that such a motion segmentation is possible and can be used for compression. <coughs> There are uh, some limitations when we look at the actual problem of estimating motion. Uh, in images, we typically only see a certain aspect of the motion. For example, assume we have an object like this one here, and it's moving in some way uh, uh, on its background. If then we focus on just a zoom in and say, where is this object moving? 
If you just look at a certain part of the object, you never see the whole motion. You, in this case, for example, you will only see the vertical part of the motion. For example, if I move this stripe pattern horizontally, then there's nothing that's going to happen here. You don't actually see any of the motion. You can imagine, right? Whereas if you move it vertically, then you can actually see the motion. And if you move it diagonally, what you will see here is the vertical component of the motion. And so this is an example that shows you nicely that we will not generally uh, be able to get all motion for all pixels but only certain components. In fact what we typically get is the motion that is normal to the isolines of a constant intensity because anything that moves along the isoline since it's a, a line of constant intensity, there is no intensity changes by definition. And so any motion in the gradient direction is what we can expect to, to estimate locally. And so we'll see actually the way nowadays motion estimation techniques work is that they essentially capture the component of the motion in the gradient direction and then they make additional assumptions of uh, spatial continuity of the motion field of spatial uh, homogeneity of the motion field smoothness of the motion field to propagate that motion information into neighboring regions more specifically the problem that we have here is called the aperture problem and the aperture problem what it refers to is the fact that you can only measure from observation a certain aspect of motion and uh, and as i said you know in the 70s and 80s the the world consisted of black squares on white ground you know i don't really remember from my childhood but it must have been like that at least if you read papers Sometimes, though, this, uh, this uh, um, simplified, uh, you know, cartoon world of black squares on white ground is useful to at least get some understanding of, of what can be measured. In this setting, let's assume the square is moving on the white background. Then, depending on where we look, so the idea is that we have an observer who looks into a certain area and has to decide What's the motion of this object? There are three possible observers that you can distinguish. One, two, and three, I call them here. And now the question to you, what is the best observer? Where would you place yourself? Yes, number three, of course, right? If you are number one, then you're stupid. I mean, you don't see anything, right? All is black, and so if the square moves a little bit, you're not going to notice. So this is the extreme case that no motion can be observed. Why is that? Because the intensity is entirely constant. There is no intensity variation here. And so if things move locally, the intensity is not going to change. The second best is number two. That is the case where you observe a motion in the horizontal direction. So whatever the motion of the square, let's say it moves diagonally, what you will see is the vertical, the horizontal part of the motion. The motion in direction of the gradient. And why is that? Because there is some intensity variation in that region, but only in the horizontal direction. The best observer is of course number three. Why? Because if the square moves, it with the numbers three will see motion in both directions, in the vertical and in the horizontal, in the horizontal and in the vertical. And that is because we have gradient in that area, we have gradients pointing this way and gradients pointing that way. And so this part will tell us the, inf the motion in the, in, the, um, in the horizontal direction and that part will tell us motion in the vertical direction. This is quite obvious, but it is very important to keep that in the back of your minds when it comes to local estimation of motion, what can be estimated. That there's these three cases, and we'll see later in the mathematical analysis, these exact three cases will emerge as well. <coughs> How do we go about mathematically estimating motion? 
The first thing, as always, is we, we you know, introduce notation. So we assume we have an image sequence, I will call it. Uh, omega is the image plane. Zero to large T is the time interval. So we assume just as the spatial uh, domain is continuous, time is here also continuous. Nevertheless, we'll be working with the discretized time in, in a second. There is many different ways to denote an image sequence, but this is a fully continuous representation. Here. And so we have a brightness value at each pixel at each time, called i of x and t. <coughs> then we want to estimate the mode, so this is what we're given, and what we are looking for is a motion field, which is a vector field uh, on this domain, so assigning a two-dimensional vector to each pixel. What that means is simply that we have the image plane and we want to know for any pixel x where is it moving and that vector we call v of x at time t. That is our motion vector, a two-dimensional vector telling us where did the structure move. When I say move, what is important here is, of course, we can only talk about motion in the image plane. It doesn't mean that is the real motion of the object. For example, if I move towards the camera, then I am moving, but the structures are not really moving with respect to the image plane, or not much. There is actually what you see on the screen when I move closer is a divergent motion, because I'm getting larger on the screen, but uh, you don't actually see the motion in the z-direction, explicitly. So this is uh, sometimes called the perceived motion or the apparent motion. This is what we are aiming to estimate. And uh, in this community it's called the optical flow. Sometimes I call it the motion vector. There's actually some people who say motion and flow should not be uh, the same, and motion is the real motion and flow is the observed motion. I, I will just call it motion, doesn't really matter, but it should be clear that you know what we're talking about is the motion in the image plane. Let's assume we have a point that moves over the image plane, so here is a point at time t, x at time t, and then it moves, and at some point, uh, say t plus 1, it is somewhere else, x at time t plus 1, and I want to know what is the motion that it underwent from t to t plus 1. The assumption that we'll make is that the brightness of that point remains the same over time. That assumption is the key assumption in correspondence estimation in this setting, as I said. Um, whether it's a good assumption, that's debatable, because the intensity is typically not perfectly constant from one point to the next, but as an approximation, it's usually pretty good. Of course, the illumination can change, so the brightnesses vary a little bit. Maybe someone comes in, switches on the light, things change, brightnesses change. But by and large, from one instance to the next, the intensities remain more or less the same. The question is always, if you don't make that, often people say that's not a good assumption. The question is, well, you have to make some assumption, right? If you don't make any assumption, right? If a point in one image and the next can have arbitrary intensities that have nothing to do with each other, well, how am I going to find the correspondence? There's no way. Right? So you have to make some some assumption what remains constant over time. And so the assumption is that the brightness is constant. And, and you can write it in this way, meaning for all times, if I read out the intensity for time t at the location x of t, so it's not always the same location, it's the location wherever that point is at time t, then that brightness is the same. It doesn't mean that the intensity at that pixel stays the same, it means the intensity evaluated at the moving point is constant. <coughs> if this function is constant for all times, it means that expression on the left-hand side, mm, uh, the derivative is constant with respect to time, and its derivative with respect to time is zero. 
and that's called the total derivative. So here I'm taking the derivative. How does this expression change with time? And it changes in a twofold way. Once in the second argument here, because I'm evaluating images at later times. And secondly, because the location where I evaluate the brightness function changes with time. And I can take both of these into account using these chain rules of differentiation. So the second gives me the partial derivative with respect to time, where I only consider how does the brightness image change in the second component. And the first part, uh, I do chain rule, so I take the derivative with of i with respect to the first argument, that is nabla, the spatial gradient, and then by chain rule I have dx by dt, so how does x then change with t? And this is interesting because dx by dt is exactly the velocity we're aiming to get, right? So this is the velocity vector, that is the the speed of the point or the velocity of that moving point. And so we have an equation that contains the derivatives of my brightness function, spatial and temporal derivative, and the velocity vector that we're interested in. So we would say, hey, great, let's just solve it for the velocity vector, right? And then we're done. The problem is, that what we have here is a scalar product. A scalar product between the spatial gradient and the velocity vector. In particular, that means whatever the component of the velocity vector that is normal to the gradient, we're not going to see it. It's not going to enter the constraint. And that's exactly what we saw earlier. Whatever the velocity orthogonal to the gradient, meaning in the direction of this edge, we're not going to measure it. It doesn't appear. It vanishes in that scalar product. We are only seeing in that sense, or we are only, the constraint only involves the projection of the velocity vector onto the gradient. So the, the component of the velocity in direction of the the discontinuity, the brightness discontinuity, the edge. And so what we saw earlier intuitively that we can only measure the horizontal velocity, here it's in the math right there. You can read it off. If you decompose this velocity vector into two components, one in the direction of the gradient, one orthogonal, the, the orthogonal one disappears in the constraint. Could be anything, we don't know. But that component in the gradient direction, that we can actually compute. It's called the normal flow, we'll see in a second. This constraint is very famous, it's called the optical flow constraint. Sometimes it's called the brightness constancy constraint equation, BCCE. There's tons of uh, names for it, which again tells you that it's been used a lot. And so there are, this is sometimes called the differential brightness constancy constraint. The brightness constancy constraint would be this one. It tells us the brightness is constant. And then the derivative of that constraint is this one. Is the derivative is zero. It's called optical flow constraint or, or differential brightness constancy constraint. And as I discussed here, the aperture problem the fact that we can only observe locally a certain component of the motion vector, the component in gradient direction, it shows up explicitly. And I put that more explicit, let's assume that we modify the, the true velocity v to a velocity v tilde by adding a field eta, uh, which is uh, normal to the gradient, so in the direction of the edge, then that normal field disappears here. And so that velocity v tilde also fulfills the flow constraint. So not only the real velocity v, we assume we have a velocity that is the correct one, so it fulfills this constraint. Then v tilde, for any uh, perturbation of the flow in the, in the in direction of the, of the edge, so in in normal to the gradient, that component will vanish here. Normal to the gradient means the scalar product with the gradient is zero, and so 
so V tilde will also fulfill the constraint. And so that shows you that the problem is not well posed, because we cannot read out one single velocity field from this constraint. We have this constraint at every pixel of the image, but we cannot get a motion field for every pixel. Nevertheless, this is often the case with constraints. They contain some information, not enough to get a unique solution, but at least some to constrain what are the feasible velocity fields. Because the velocity in the gradient direction, we can actually determine it. In fact, the velocity in the gradient direction, called v orthogonal, is nothing but the projection of the velocity onto the unit vector in gradient direction, that is nabla i over norm nabla i. And so this is a little bit of an issue. We cannot directly extract the velocity field from the optical flow constraint. That would be wonderful, then we would be done, but then there wouldn't be so many papers on the topic. But this component we can compute, and what is it? Let's look into the equation. If we go back to, to the optical flow equation, nabla i transpose v is nothing but minus i t, if I take the time derivative to the right-hand side. And if I divide by the norm of the gradient, that gives me exactly the so-called normal flow. And that I can compute, so that's easy to compute the flow at each pixel in direction of the gradient, we can do that. And in principle, you could say, I'm done there. That's all I can compute from the images. This is all I know. The rest can be, in principle, anything. But the assumption uh, that will arise now is based on the following consideration. Here I can determine the motion in this direction, as we said, in the direction of the gradient. Here I can determine the flow in that direction. And now I can try to estimate the entire motion of this area by assuming that the motion is constant in that neighborhood. And then I can measure the component in this direction and the component in that direction and assuming that from this point to that point the motion field hasn't changed too much or is essentially constant, I can get the full velocity for that observer. And that will be the second assumption that we make. So there is two assumptions. One is brightness constancy and the other one is um, spatial smoothness or spatial constancy of the flow field. So the flow vector doesn't change too much from one point to the neighboring point. And actually, <coughs> so here's an example, by the way, of this normal flow. These are two images I took back when I was still doing a PhD out of my window. And this is actually the train station in Mannheim. Uh, and uh, we had an office right uh, opposite. And so I took images and you see the cars are moving here. And the, the, the train is moving, the trolley is moving here. And um, this here is the time, the temporal derivative. Uh, we would discretize it simply by, by taking the difference of the two brightness uh, images. This is what you see here. So this is actually quite helpful. It shows you just by doing the derivative of neighboring of uh, uh, two consecutive images, the difference between two consecutive images, you get a fairly good understanding of what things are moving. And this is an extremely cheap processing approach that is used very frequently in industrial image analysis, just typically the assumption though being that the camera is not moving. And this is, sometimes people talk about motion analysis here, I would not call this motion, this is really just a change detection. You detect what has changed in terms of the brightness. And what you can do typically uh, is uh, it works quite well for a lot of applications is to threshold that difference. 
and check when is it sufficiently large and then you get points that are white if something moved or the chain the brightness changed enough and they're dark if not and so this i would call this a change detection approach here from this if you divide by the gradient of the image nabla i for symmetry reasons you might want to take nabla of i1 plus i2 over 2 um, so uh, the intermediate or the, the, the mean of the two images and then you get this here and this is called the, the and so what we what I plot here is the norm of this and that would be the norm of the normal flow it, it tells me how much f is what size is the flow in gradient direction and so you see the cars are lighting up the trolley is lighting up, but you see, first of all, there's many patches of the cars that are not lighting up because the brightnesses are constant in that area, so they don't show up. And secondly, you see that a lot of tiny pixels light up because the brightness changed a little bit due to illumination fluctuations, etc. There is, by the way, one point that I found that quite interesting in that scene. There is at this point here, this here is a fairly big, fairly big bright spot. That is a little dove that is walking along there. I checked the original video, you can't really see it in this resolution, but there is a little dove walking. So the nice thing is these techniques in principle are able to even pick up little the motion of little birds in the scene. But we'll see the key challenge here is to get from this rather naive estimate of what's going on to a more exact quantitative and correct estimate of motion. And that implies, first of all, we would like to densify this uh, area and, and figure out what, uh, you know, assuming that neighboring points move in the same way, we might be able to pick up the motion of the entire object and we would like to suppress a lot of these fine scale fluctuations. How do we do that? The assumption is spatial regularity. And in fact, there are two complementary approaches uh, that were proposed back in 1981. In, and from that point of view you could argue today that 1981 is the birth of um, motion estimation algorithms. And in fact it is also the birth of variational methods. Because for computer vision, of course, not in general, but in computer vision, uh, the work of Horn and Chunk in 1981, we'll talk about it in, in a bit, is considered the first variational approach, or it's one of the first variational approaches to image analysis problems. <coughs> The two approaches are complementary and both have been extremely influential. The work of Lucas Canade from 81 has to date 7,600 citations. The work of Horn and Chunk has 8,900 citations. What's interesting about this and what you don't see in the numbers as shown here is that historically the Lucas Canade was the more influential one. So if you went back 10 years, you would find that paper had far more citations than the Horn and Chunk paper. The reason being that 10 years ago, people were not using variational methods a lot. The reason being that this approach is much simpler and it runs in real time on a CPU. And it did so even, say, 10 years ago. This approach 10 years ago was far from real time because algorithms were not as evolved, because we didn't have computational resources and power, CPUs were slower, graphics cards were not being used as much and were not as powerful. Today the picture has changed. Today with more powerful hardware, with very fast and powerful graphics cards, we can easily run this horn and chunk in real time even for fairly large images, even at you know 60 frames a second, no problem. And the picture, that, that way the picture changed. In addition, a lot of, we'll see later, in the last 10 years we saw a lot of 
generalizations of the original horn and chunk, improvements, extensions of the original horn and chunk, which make it far more powerful than the Lucas Canade approach. And so this is not uncommon in science that when two methods start out in a competition, at a first glance one method seems more promising. Maybe because it's easier, maybe it's easier to understand, to implement, uh, maybe because it works better, it provides better results. We'll actually see that in a second. But that doesn't mean the other method is not good. It may mean that the other method may still have more potential on the long run. Much like in horse races, you know, sometimes some horse is faster in one race, but maybe the other horse is still a bit young and on the long run it will catch up. And I think this is a little bit like that, you know, the, the variational methods were young, that was the beginning of it. And, and so, for example, I was saying today you can run this as 60 frames a second easily, even on a CPU actually. Definitely 30 frames a second are possible on a CPU. <clears throat> um, back in 1981 and in the early 90s, you would have to run the algorithm overnight to compute the flow field. And that meant it had very little practical value. For a lot of applications of motion estimation, tracking, etc., you want speed, you want real-time performance. And so there's a huge change from an algorithm that runs 12 hours to an algorithm that runs 30 frames a second. It's actually quite amazing how far we have come in, in these couple of years. And so as a consequence, today the horn and chunk has many more citations compared to the Lucas Canade. But in the past that was the one that everyone cited. So we'll talk about both of these approaches because they're related but in, in many ways different. I'll start with the Lucas Canade approach. The nice thing about the Lucas Canade is it's fairly easy to understand and you don't need variational methods, you don't need a sophisticated math. In principle you don't even need integrals. That means even an engineer with, with little mathematical background would be able to understand the paper. Still, of course, to stick with the coherent notation, I am writing everything with integrals. I believe the original paper contains sums over pixels. The idea is very simple. The idea is that in addition to the brightness constancy constraint, that tells us, I'll write it down here, the differential version says nabla i transposed v plus the time derivative of the intensity is zero for all pixels x. So this is always for all x in omega. That we know. That we saw is not sufficient to get a unique flow vector for every pixel. What can we do? In addition, we assume that the velocity v is constant in an entire window. So we assume V is constant for all X, for all X in some window, and uh, I'll call it X prime, in a window U sigma around X and Y. So we assume that there is a point X here, and that there is a certain window, let's call it U sigma of X, so that's the window centered at X, and um, we assume it's constant. I will actually put x and y, the two uh, components uh, of the pixel. The assumption is that this is constant, so this flow constraint should be true for all pixels x prime in that window. Of course, it's never exactly true, so what can we do? We just minimize the least squares of this, right? So. The, the, this should be small or zero, ideally zero, but in practice maybe just small. And then we penalize this expression in a least square sense in summing over all the pixels in that, in that window. And so I wrote it out here. But what's crucial in the Lucas Canade approach, V is just one single 2D vector. It's not a vector field, but it's just two numbers, I call them V1 and V2, the X and the Y component of that flow vector, so we assume the whole window moves with one single velocity vector. That's important because it means V 
doesn't depend on x prime and y prime, right? So it's just a, an, a, essentially two numbers, and so uh, we can easily say the minimizer of this least squares problem is obtained by taking the derivative and setting it to zero. And now, not surprisingly, since we chose a quadratic penalizer here, we get an expression that is quadratic in the two numbers v1 and v2, and so um, the extremality conditions are just linear equations by construction. Linear equations in v1 and v2, but keep in mind v1 and v2 don't depend on the integral. So for each term in this integral, we can actually pull v1 and v2 out of the integral. Here, by the way, and so when you see a derivative, keep in mind this is not an Euler-Lagrange equation. V is not a field, it's just a number. And so this is just an expression that depends on two numbers. And so we take the derivative of that expression with respect to each of these two values. And so here, the square comes down. I drop the factor of 2 here, uh, so it should be two times this, doesn't really matter. Um, and then the, we get the, the in, inner derivative of this expression with respect to v1 that gives us the factor ix. And similarly, when I take derivative with respect to v2, I get the factor iy down here. And so both of these expressions must be zero, and we can condense them into an equation system. Here the two equations are again, and you can write this as a linear equation system, m times v equals b, where m is uh, this here and b is that here. That may have been a little fast, but if you look at it, the, the, the first part of the equation is ix times ix dx prime, and then ix times iy dx prime. These are just the first. This is a matrix. Maybe I should that write that down. Uh, nabla i, nabla i transpose is a matrix that has ix squared here, iy squared here, and here ix iy. I x i y. It's a symmetric matrix, and this is what we have here. And so the integral of this matrix d x prime, d x prime, that is what we call m. And then b similarly is is the terms that don't depend on v, and that is just i x times i t, and down here i i y times i t, and I can write that as the gradient times it. And so this is the linear equation system, and so the solution for the velocity vector is m to the minus 1b. So very simple, a matrix inversion, and what's even better is this is just a 2 by 2 matrix. You know, it's nothing profound. And actually inverting 2 by 2 matrices, you can even have a closed form solution for that. Very straightforward. And so, essentially, we're done. There's one last step to keep in mind. Matrices are not always invertible, right? And uh, so there are actually, you, we should keep that in mind. Maybe one comment uh, in the Lucas, in the original Lucas Canade paper, they're summing over all pixels in the window. So in that sense, all these pixels equally contribute to this least squares problem. In practice, uh, you get slightly better results by giving a little more weight to the central pixels. Because what I really want is I want the motion of that central pixel. And so I use the aggregated information from that neighborhood, but ideally I would put more emphasis on the central pixels and less on the further away pixels. In that sense, uh, um, making it more kind of weighted towards the center. And you can do that by just adding a weighting factor. So in addition to this least squares thing, you have a weighted least squares problem. And the weights, you will choose maybe a Gaussian distribution that falls off uh, with some sigma. You give more weight to the central pixels and towards the outside it falls off. And so what you have here is a convolution of, of that uh, optic flow constraint squared with a Gaussian. 
and that would be the energy. For the vector v, it doesn't really matter whether you take a standard for the math, it, it basically carries through all the way, you get the same or a similar linear equation system and what you have is the matrix is the Gaussian smoothed version of that, of that thing here. And similarly, B is the Gaussian smoothed version of Nabla I and IT. And this matrix M is called the structure tensor. Actually, whether the structure tensor is this one, or this one, you know, that depends on what papers you read, but it, the, the fundamentally it's essentially the same, whether you have an equal weighting for all pixels or a Gaussian weighting favoring the central pixels, you know, it's not so important. This matrix, however, is important. It's been used frequently for all sorts of things. It's called the structure tensor. Some people would argue, why do you call it a tensor if it's just a matrix, right? Why don't we call it structure matrix? You know, it has two components, so it... Um, I think the term structure tensor stuck in the community because it sounds more bombastic. And so this is the linear equation system that we have to solve. Uh, uh, but as you know, matrices are not always invertible. In fact, you can distinguish three cases. One case is the case where the gradient in the entire window is exactly zero. What happens then is, you see it here, the gradient is zero, so that expression is zero, and so consequently the matrix itself is zero then I have no constraint, then I have zero equals zero, useless, right? And so then I cannot invert anything because the matrix itself is zero. And that is exactly the case that we saw earlier here. Where is it? This case. Gradient is constant zero. I don't see anything. The matrix M is zero. I cannot estimate motion. The next thing that happens, number two, is that the gradient is non-zero, but all gradients point in the same direction. In that case, the rank of this matrix is 1. It's actually always 1, but since M is just the sum of these vectors, and they all point in the same, uh, of these expressions, these matrices, and they all point in the same direction, M is nothing, it's proportional to nabla i, nabla i transposed. And so as a consequence, the rank of M is also 1. And rank being 1 means there is some vector that is mapped to 0. And you can actually read it off. The vector that is orthogonal to the gradient will be mapped to 0 because the matrix multiplies with, it, with that gradient, obviously. So if I have a vector let's call it eta, that is orthogonal to the gradient in my window, um, <clears throat> then m times eta is zero. So there is a vector that is mapped to zero, a non-zero vector that is mapped to zero, and so we cannot invert the matrix completely. It only has one non-zero eigenvalue, and it essentially means that we can only determine the normal flow. And you can t test whether you, you are in that scenario by checking the determinant. Is it, uh, you know, the determinant is, is the product of eigenvalues. If one of them is zero, then the determinant is also zero. In practice, for numerical reasons, it will never be exactly zero, but you can check is it smaller than epsilon. And if yes, then you are in a degenerate case where essentially you're looking at an edge. And the best case, again, is the observer number three, is when the rank of M is really two, meaning the determinant is non-zero, or more specifically, it's larger than epsilon, and in that case, you can invert the matrix. You can invert the matrix, and you can compute the velocity in that location. And so this is what the lucas Canade method does. Uh, given two consecutive images, it computes a flow field, and what you see here is the color-coded flow. 
It differs from what I showed you, this change detection and the norm of the normal flow in two ways. First of all, there is no more background structures here. Secondly, the objects are more dense, as you can see. <coughs> So that's good. And uh, the other th aspect is uh, actually that in addition to having the magnitude of the flow, I really have a direction of the flow. I can compute which direction things are moving and typically people color code the flow. There's different color codes that are being used. In, in the slides here, I'll be using this color code. It essentially means I can read off that the tramway is going to the right and the cars are going more to the left, actually. But the other thing you see is that there are some parts, red and purple here, where the motion is clearly estimated incorrectly. So interestingly, the algorithm claims that uh, these parts of the car are moving down or to the right. <coughs> and um, so we see the flow is better, but it's not perfect in the sense. The motion that we estimate for this car is not exact, but this may also be due to the fact that these parts are highly reflecting. So the brightness constancy assumption for, for, for the roof here will not be fulfilled definitely. The same structure will have very different intensity from one image to the other because you see you know, buildings or whatever reflected in the roof. And that will uh, deteriorate the motion estimates. Okay, that was the Lucas Canade method. Next time we'll be talking about the Horn and Shank, the variational approach. Thank you very much. <coughs>